Colorado's weather is changing, and that means business plans are changing for the state's largest employer, the airport. We have long been setting these small fires on purpose, trying to prevent larger wildfires we can't control. Is that still a smart strategy in an increasingly dry state? A Republican candidate for Congress accuses her Democratic opponent of performing abortions. She's a pediatrician. The state legislature is in a mad rush to pass bills before midnight. That sounds like a smart way to make laws. And a lot of young people who age out of our foster care system still need help. A nonprofit offers an eight year track to support their success as adults. We can help them do it because you don't just watch because this is next. Colorado's largest employer is particularly sensitive to which way the wind is blowing. It can mean the difference between business humming along and things grinding to a halt at Denver International Airport. So they're preparing for different weather than they've seen in the past. Here's Anusha Roy. Yesterday evening, winds gusted as high as 36 miles an hour. Southwest said there was a brief ground stop as we tracked a flight circling around DIA. It stacks airplanes up. When we pulled back, we saw the airborne traffic. Depending on where they're coming from, they're typically an hour and they can hold 30 minutes to an hour and a hold and then they have to make a decision whether they're going to stay and continue to hold if they know they're going to get in or they're going to have to make a decision to go to an alternate. It's a well orchestrated song and dance that everyone from air traffic control to pilots are trained for. Airplanes in a racetrack holding pattern at various altitudes. And then as the arrivals or departures allow, they will then cycle these airplanes into, if they're landing at Denver, cycle them into the flow. Airlines and airports are ready for bad weather, but aviation expert Greg Feith said the game is a little different with the number of back-to-back -back high wind days. When we have a snowstorm in Denver and they shut the airport down, you know what the ripple effect is. With the changing weather that we're having and, and the climate issues that uh, we keep talking about, I think that that's going to have to be factored into how they build schedules. At the same time, DIA has big goals. Increase the number of passengers coming through Den to 100 million um, passengers per year over the course of the next 10 years. And with that comes expansions and responsibility. The airport is not only trying to be more environmentally friendly. We're going to have new facilities that are 30 and 40% um, percent more energy and water efficient. But planning for a different climate, whether that's building out the airport to be ready for storms to change over the next several decades, or making sure they can keep the airport cool efficiently and cut down emissions, knowing as the state warms up, it'll be used more. We know those demands are only gonna increase over time. So that means the concourse expansions are being built to be environmentally friendly, low carbon emissions, 100 acres dedicated to solar energy. But ultimately, it is up to the FAA to decide if a flight can or cannot take off and land. They said that they rely heavily, Kyle, on the National Weather Service. Every one of their air traffic control centers have multiple meteorologists from there to give a minute by minute weather conditions to decide can you or can you not take off or land. It, not necessarily a safety issue as they look forward. Yeah, Greg was very specific about that. He said everybody from pilots, FAA, everybody's trained on what to do with high winds, right? That part is not new. We're talking about the unusual number of days of high winds mm -hmm. and what that means long term for airports. Logistics that impacts the, logistics. the bottom line. Anusha, thank you. Last time I said controlled burn here, I got lit up by a firefighter and rightly so. We call them prescribed burns because even fires set on purpose can sweep out of control, like what happened near Keystone over the weekend. Got our Marshal Zellinger wondering about using fire to fight fire when it is so constantly dry and windy. The landscape of Keystone Gulch on U.S. Forest Service land alongside Keystone Ski Resort looks charred and burned on purpose. There's a lot of value in reducing these fuels off the landscape, and there's still risk associated with it, We've, but that's, that's what we do. That's our job. Adam Bianchi is from the Dillon Ranger District, which oversaw a prescribed burn of this area last Wednesday and Thursday. We know how important it is to, uh, there's the wind. It was that wind on Saturday that led the fire to reignite unexpectedly it ignited at kind of rekindled itself about 3:30, and so at the time there wasn't somebody physically sitting here at 3:30, 30 uh, but we had resources here on scene soon after there are crews with water trucks still monitoring today is that problematic that it rekindled 
even though it stayed within the boundaries? Um, to us, we have those contingencies in place. And so do I love to see that it kind of picked itself back up? Not necessarily, but we plan for those things to happen. Ten years ago, Jefferson County set a prescribed fire in the lower North Fork area, southeast of Conifer. After the burn was out, it was not properly monitored for the required three days and reignited on day four. That fire killed three people and destroyed nearly two dozen homes. It led the state to tighten the criteria for using prescribed burns. The U.S. Forest Service has different requirements than the state, but there is plenty of overlap. They must do a test burn, have half an inch of snow on the ground, and complete a go-no-go -no -go checklist, which asks a few questions before you can start, like, do you have all the permits? And have you obtained all fire weather forecasts, and are they favorable? We were aware of the winds, but we have a lot of contingency in place, knowing as you came up the road, you could see all the other treatment that was also done. We had snow coverage on all sides. You know, we felt comfortable. We'd been burning earlier in the week. Um, we were monitoring after, and we weren't seeing any issues, even with the wind. So we were feeling comfortable with, with our operations. This year, the U.S. Forest Service has had 39 days where it could burn. 31 of those 39 never happened. The forecast was not favorable. Of the other eight, seven got the go. One actually got the no-go. This has got to be like anything else. If you lose one tool, you're going to have to rely on others more. Yeah, they did this fire to protect homes at the bottom of the hill and the Keystone Resort up top uh, and, and next to it. But if you can't do this, the, the thinking is it would be a fire break if there was another wildfire that came through. It would give firefighters a chance to get ahead of it and protect those areas. Mm -hmm. But if you can't do this, perhaps if you have a wildfire and there are no homes nearby, you draw the perimeter of where you're going to stop it farther out hey, it's burning, there's no homes. Instead of stopping it here, maybe we stop yeah. it here and it helps out somehow. Let it run a bit more. Marshall, thank you. A doctor running for Congress in Colorado is being smeared as an abortionist. She's a pediatrician. The Republican opponent and the talk radio host making this claim have not been able to point to evidence to support what they're saying about Dr. Yadira Caraveo. Caraveo is the presumptive Democratic nominee in Colorado's new 8th Congressional District in Adams and Weld County. She's a practicing pediatrician and State House Representative. Caraveo has talked openly about speaking with pregnant teenagers about their health care options. Lori Sane, a Republican running in the 8th District, along with talk radio host Dan Kaplis, have both claimed, without evidence, that Dr. Caraveo has performed abortions. Her spokeswoman says it's not true, and they don't know where Sane and Kaplis are coming up with this kind of thing. Who's going to vote for an abortionist? And I understand this, this doctor does more than conduct abortions, but the simple fact that she has conducted abortions and you tell us that she's proud of that and advertising that? We asked Kaplis for evidence of his claim, and he said that Caraveo could come on his radio show to refute what he said. He later told us, that he has told his radio audience that he is not currently concluding that Caraveo performs abortions. Sane could provide no evidence to back up her claim either. I heard something the other day that just kind of stopped me in my tracks. I was talking to people who run a program that helps young Coloradans who are coming out of the foster care system, and they said that 40% of the people that they work with are young parents themselves by the time they transition out of foster care and into this program. So supporting teenagers leaving foster care these days often means supporting a whole young family. That's why this week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign will help the Bridging the Gap program provide that specialized support. It begins with safe and stable housing for young Coloradans who are aging out of the foster care system and then help completing their education if that's what they need, or career counseling. Maybe it's child care so that they can focus on school or a job. And this is not just like one-time help, like, hey, welcome to the world of adulthood, good luck. Bridging the Gap has an eight-year program so that these young Coloradans leaving foster care, often already with a child of their own, get sustained support so that they can succeed in life. The program is backed up by the resources of Mile High United Way. One of their biggest challenges has been finding housing, so they just purchased a 25-unit building. Young people are moving in there this month. Bridging the Gap's coaches and counselors will be on site at the building to help them. Teenagers leaving foster care may wonder if the world, they may wonder if Colorado cares about them and their future. Bridging the Gap proves that we do care. 
So scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 and I'll send you the link to donate. You know that we have done nearly $9 million worth of good together and even $5 helps the cost. So like every week, I'll match the first 50 donations of five bucks. Bridging the Gap tells teenagers coming out of foster care in Colorado that this community wants them to succeed and we're alongside them for the long haul. Democrats left fentanyl for last. One of the most hotly debated bills at the state capitol still isn't decided with less than six hours to go. One of you asked a timely question. Why is the state legislature on a clock? Why not stay till the work is done? And it's looking more likely that Colorado can't hold on to Space Command, which will be making its new sweet home in Alabama. That's next. Procrastination. It's not just for high schoolers anymore. State legislators have less than six hours tonight to finish their work. They did pass a bill allowing for early tax refunds while they continue to debate the most controversial bill of the session, whether to charge Coloradans with felonies if they have a pill or a powder that contains fentanyl and they don't know about it. Legislators have agreed to give extra security to the Secretary of State, Attorney General, and State Treasurer. They approved protecting teachers from doxing the way that Colorado protects health care workers. They okayed a plan to allow drunk drivers to apply for an interlock restricted license right away so they're not driving without a breath check. But they did not finish a bill that would ban drivers from all cell phone use. Tonight's next question comes to us from Tom. Curious why the state legislature is done at midnight when there are so many bills likely to be left on the table. Tom, it is that pesky state constitution. So buckle up for the quick history on this. When Colorado first became a state, the legislature only met every other year. In 1950, constitutional amendment changed it to yearly sessions, but some issues could only be discussed every other year. It wasn't until 1982 when a ballot measure made every topic fair game each year. Part of that deal in 82 was a 140 day limit on the legislative session every other year. It was 1988 when Colorado voters narrowly approved the current 120 day limit on each legislative session. That conservative constraint on state government remains in an increasingly progressive state. Changing the 120 day limit would take a new constitutional amendment. Tom, that was a great question. So who wants to be next? Record your question on video or audio. Email it to next at 9news.com. If you're wondering, I bet somebody else is too. You have sent us a stack of smart questions lately about Colorado's accelerated tax refund. So let's get at those. So we've been talking about this. These are the typical refunds that are required under the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. The refunds that Democrats have decided to send out early before Election Day and hope that you remember which side your bread is buttered on. A next viewer named Keith was curious whether Coloradans on Social Security will get these refund checks. Keith, we took your question to Mark Ferrandino with the State Department of Revenue. Most people uh, on Social Security do file a tax return. They're filing a federal and a state tax return. Um, so they would be eligible if they got filed the state tax return. If they do not need to file a tax return for some reason, um, just like anyone who doesn't need to file a tax return, they can go in and file a zero return. That's a pretty easy process. There's information on how to file a zero dollar tax return on the Colorado Department of Revenue website. Another question from Lana, who says she only lived in Colorado for part of the last year. She was curious if people who moved in or moved out of state in 2021 get this cash. Lana, the state says that you must have lived in Colorado for the entire 2021 calendar year to be eligible. If you just moved into the state, uh, hopefully you're staying here for a long time and you'll get it uh, next year if we have a Tabor refund. Um, but if you are a part-time resident, um, or have just been here for a little bit, you aren't eligible for this refund. We know that there are some former Coloradans who tell us that they still watch this show online, if that's you watching from wherever, and you were here for all of 2021 and then you moved, you will get a check. It's going to get mailed to your old address. You can update that address online at the Department of Revenue website. The Pentagon says Colorado losing Space Command to Alabama was not necessarily shady business cross the double yellow and you could get pulled over. How about when the yellow lines double cross themselves? An odd addition of your old favorite segment, you've crossed a line, next. 
A new federal report says Colorado losing Space Command to Alabama did not involve any funny business. The investigation actually contradicts former President Trump's claim that he single-handedly decided to move Space Command out of Colorado to Alabama. So U.S. Space Command is at Peterson Air Force Base in the Springs right now. A Pentagon report says that they consider the Springs to be the preferred lo location, but that Huntsville, Alabama is a feasible alternative. This is a big-time setback to Colorado's bipartisan congressional delegation. They were united in wanting this process investigated. Colorado Springs Mayor John Southers does not appear to be giving up. He says the Peterson Air Force Base is still the better choice based on cost and how quickly it can be brought up to full operation. How quickly can we get this thing standing up? And uh, essentially, the conclusion is that you can get full operational capability in Colorado Springs in two to three years. In fact, the process is ongoing right now. If you move to Huntsville, uh, it's going to take at least six years. Mayor Souther says he'll make his case directly to the Secretary of Defense when he visits the Springs in a few weeks. Souther said that even if Space Command goes south, he expects the military will continue to expand its presence in the area. The warmest, windiest day of the week, lots of sunshine and temperatures in record territory. The winds will ease somewhat after sunset, but red flag warnings continue as highs soar in the upper 80s for Denver. We just missed that record by one, close to 100 degrees in southern Colorado. Clouds increasing ahead of a storm that won't bring any moisture, but will bring temperatures down into the 70s tomorrow. We're still tracking extremely gusty conditions over southern Colorado, and red flag warnings in effect until 9 o'clock tonight will be reinstated for many areas tomorrow. Even with this system coming in, not much moisture. And so we'll be cooler and less wind tomorrow, 73, 76 Friday, and then sunshine in 80s heading into the weekend. Remember our old segment, trying to preserve parking spaces in our state, calling out Coloradans who crossed the line? What happens when the lines cross themselves? James sent us a poor paint job in Thornton he saw on Monday. It was going well for a little while, and then, and then we will wobble. Uh, this is the double yellow crossing itself on York Street near 152nd. Drivers, beware. If you're in the area, you will be held to a higher standard. They've aged out of the foster care system, yet they still need our community's help to succeed. We can assist young Coloradans in bridging the gap between foster care and adulthood. That and your feedback next. One of your most frequently requested causes for our Word of Thanks microgiving campaigns is help for young Coloradans who are aging out of foster care. I've read your emails. It doesn't sit right with you that when people hit a certain age, they're on their own. Bridging the Gap does just what it says. It offers an eight-year program of housing support, career coaching, even child care, if that's what people need, so that young folks leaving foster care are supported fully into adulthood. Scan the QR code on the screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to join me in giving to Bridging the Gap a project of Mile High United Way. They provide sustained support for these young Coloradans, help that they may or may not have received while they were in foster care. A lot of feedback tonight about the uh, unsupported claim being made about Congressional candidate Dr. Yavira Caraveo. She's a pediatrician. Her opponent claims that she performs abortions, hasn't provided evidence. Jane writes in, so Dan Kaplis and Lori Sane get to make up information without basis in fact and then ask Caraveo to rebut the negative? That's irresponsible. Mark McGee notes, there are no consequences for lying. We'll see you next time.